Right? Have you heard our intro you song before? started in hard yeah. times yeah. to bring us all in. <laughs> Welcome Into to a special bonus episode of Public Power Underground and an especially wonky episode. We're diving deep into electric market design discussions with Jacob Mays, an assistant professor in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University, who focuses on design and analysis of electricity markets and has published a bunch of articles on the topic that we're going to try to make infotaining. We're going to try it. Professor Mays, welcome to Public Power Underground. Thanks so much for having me. I, I, you, you've heard the intro song before, so you at least have some, some familiarity. I have, yeah, and and I know the original too. But uh, you um, do, you know, Roll yeah. Out Columbia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How are you from the Northwest? No, although uh, it turns out my uh, my wife's grandfather was born in Clatskanie, Oregon. No so way. You have yeah. So so she grew up in the Northwest, and uh, and and so I have a special connection to uh, to the unbelievable to, to you guys over there. Unbelievable. Yeah. Your your wife's <laughs> grandfather. That's right. Was yep. he uh, like a logger? What was his? He was. Yep. Yep. Full that, family of loggers. That makes a bunch of sense. Well, that's really exciting. We have a connection. Bring it together. Yeah. Energy Twitter, bringing people together. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I reached out to you because of some articles you shared on Energy Twitter uh, that I found incredibly interesting. I want to say, kind of to get started, that I have always been hesitant in reading some of the articles that get shared on Energy Twitter because I'm not an academic. I find the, the, them daunting. They're long. They're PDFs. I like hard books and, uh, I guess, scrolling through Twitter like, uh, like a modern millennial. Um, but when I got into your articles, I found them really accessible. So I wanted to just start with a compliment that it, these, are, these are really accessible, really good explanations of some of the complicated things we do deal with in power markets. So thank you. And if anybody else is listening, you should try. He's, Jacob's great. He's a great author. Well, thanks. Thanks for saying so. And it's um, definitely one of the things that I have found most valuable about being on Energy Twitter as an academic is is that you get reactions from from people from you know other academic disciplines, people from industry, people from advocacy, the, the kind, of, kind of all angles of the electricity system. And I think it is a lot. Uh, a lot of perspectives and a lot of ability to model the system in a in a more accurate way, or something that's capturing all of the all of the important factors. And so I, I found it really uh, really valuable to have people reading it, reading what I write that aren't just you know other engineers or other mathematicians. Uh, so 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 thanks for saying so. And well, thanks yeah. for taking a look. Yeah, well, I, I think I, I assume it sometimes get frustrating because we are not as sophisticated and don't always get the point. Right. Sometimes we don't get the point of why you're doing your academic study and we maybe draw conclusions that we shouldn't, which is why we're here. And we're going to talk about some stuff to see yeah. if we're interpreting it correctly. I'm very excited about this. Great. Um, I thought a good entry point actually last last week, late last week, uh, the Texas grid had another constrained event. Uh, where they ask their electric, uh, the electric consumers in Texas to reduce their demand. Uh, there were six power plants that tripped offline and had tight grid conditions in May, Jacob, in May. Is that surprising mm -hmm. to you? Any commentary on that? Well, I think the, the thing that I'm most curious about in this is uh, since basically last summer, ERCOT has been pulling plants off of their maintenance schedules, trying to make it seem like they had more reserves than they had, uh, holding extra reserves online in, in just a, in an unsustainable way and not really a principled way. Um, and so one of the things that, that a lot of people have been concerned about over the past year is you can't defer maintenance forever without causing problems. And and so to what extent has, has ERCOT kind of uh, gotten themselves into this situation uh, with the the uh, what they call a conservative operation posture, but really is just uh, reliability theater. So, so uh, keeping keeping plants online in the short term, but you know maybe causing problems in the long term. So that's context that I did not have. Like I, so I work in the Pacific Northwest. I don't pay that much attention to ERCOT's behavior. So they've been keeping thermal units online through maintenance cycles in order to maintain reserve margins through events yeah, of that kind yeah. of? Yeah, so they, that one of the, 
one of the both the official responses to Winter Storm Yuri uh, last uh, last year. One of the official responses was to hold additional operating reserves, and then on top of that, ERCOT has been kind of uh, procuring additional reserves out of the market uh, around uh, uh, over the course of the last year. Uh, basically, and then there have been more specific events where they recalled plants that had scheduled maintenance uh, to, to make sure that they were online to prepare for for different events. And I think the the combined toll of that over the course of the year it has to add up. Um, I'm 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 not you know uh, up on the details of which plants they have, have failed, and so I don't want to uh, uh, yeah. judge this, but. I think there, that's something that definitely needs to be considered. And more generally, we just need a principled approach to uh, to, to markets and and, uh, and maintenance scheduling and, and outage coordination and things like that. And yeah. not just, we want to pretend like we're more reliable than we are, so we're going to hold, hold plants online in the short term. If nothing, not a, if nothing else, reliability theater is bad karma, and uh, we uh-huh, should be sure. avoiding bad karma, right? I mean, maybe. Um, th- that's a really good pivot because you wrote a paper, and it's the first paper I wanted to talk about, uh, around private risk and resilience in liberalized electricity markets, um, where you and et al., which is a, a group of co-authors, uh, looked at the, the, what was it, February 2021 event, Winter Storm Uri, that we just were, were talking about. Um, I wrote a lead for this uh, after reading it. I wrote a little intro lead. Are you ready for my intro lead? Give it a little bit of I'm public, ready. public ready. power underground punch, okay? In yeah. a banger of an academic journal article, Mays et al. investigate the events of Winter Storm Uri in February 2021 through the lens of electric market design to test the hypothesis of whether decentralized markets are prone to underinvestment in resiliency. Mays et al. constructed a model focused on rare events because stress testing a market design during edge cases to see if it works the way it's supposed to makes a bunch of sense. The results may not surprise you. May that all argue that the problem is not in real-time price formation, but in translating those real-time prices into forward-looking investments. How's that feel? You got it. Yeah. So I, I think that um, uh, maybe the the one uh, one one question you might ask is: uh, it might be surprising for some people. It might be not surprising for others. It kind of and. It, it depends because uh, certainly after the storm, there was a lot of hot takes on Twitter, a lot of people chiming in and saying, this is why this failed. It was deregulation. It was they don't have a capacity market. It was uh, they have a price cap. It was um, they uh, didn't regulate the gas system. It was the wind turbines. There's, there's a lot of blame being. Plenty of blame. Around. Plenty of blame for everybody. And, right. Right, and and I think uh, what we wanted to do is is be more rigorous about saying, okay, to what extent was this a market design issue, uh, and then can we be more rigorous about identifying specifically, you know, what's the failure in the market, uh, and and how do we go about intervening or or making a, a regulatory correction to to try to make things uh, function in a better way. Yeah, and and try to say, tie it back to the most recent event. Like it seems like holding operating reserves doesn't really help if you you just don't have enough physical resources to maintain the reliability, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're at least the angle here is you need some forward-looking investments. You need to be able to incentivize forward-looking investments because you need more of these resources to maintain the reliability. So yeah. holding operating reserves is a band-aid, but in order to actually heal the wound, you need some stitches. Right. Right, and and uh, and so I think in in the ERCOT context, uh, kind of the idea of an energy only market design is is you set spot prices and then you let the market participants figure it out how they how they're gonna uh, make their forward looking investments how they're gonna prepare their uh, do their winterization right. prepare the uh, fuel supply contracts etc. Uh, and and if you just tweak the amount of operating reserves that you're holding on the system, that'll have an effect on spot prices. So you might you might raise spot prices and and incentivize a little bit more investment. But if you don't really resolve the link uh, between uh, spot prices and people being willing to risk uh, their capital and, and invest in that market, um, you might not have the effect that that you think you're going to have. It might just be uh, just kind of a, 
uh, a Band-Aid on a, on a I, I, can't, uh, I can't remember which, uh, uh, which injury you used, but uh, I just had a cut as opposed to as opposed to a real real solution. It sounds like you got a baby in the background. My my three year old gets injured all the time, and sometimes it just takes a band aid, you know. And sometimes actually <laughs> probably should get stitches. Both both, both my two year old and our newborn have been sick this week, so it's been a, it's been an eventful uh, eventful week. <laughs> yeah, sick get, they get sick at the same time, and then the parents get sick, and it's always the it's always a journey, always it's a coming. journey. It's, it's coming. coming, it's coming. Um, there, that, that it's a good. Time. There's two articles I wanted to talk about. The next one is uh, a co-authored piece with Jesse Jenkins about electricity markets and deep decarbonization. Um, and and it, I think Texas is a very has a lot of renewable resources, and so there is some context here where it, maybe it is a good proxy for what we could expect possibly during the transition under deep decarbonization. But I got another lead for the second article. Are you ready for it? Ready. Okay. In a clever use of an optimization model, Mays and Jenkins consider whether a shift towards zero marginal cost energy sources are likely to lead to a higher cost of capital in competitive markets as a result of increased price volatility. The analysis provides directional insight into where electric markets might evolve under deep decarbonization. And spoiler alert, overall financial risk in the system falls in high variable renewable energy scenarios. What do you think? You got it. The uh, so um, so I want to pick on one word again. Please do. And 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 because you said we were going to get wonky in the in the introduction, I'm gonna just gonna gonna go dial it up to ten here. Dive in. Uh, So 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 I think you said the clever use of an optimization model. Ooh. We're really doing is an equilibrium model. Okay. So the distinction here is. I'm gonna uh, edit live edit. Opti- optimization models used all over the place in electricity planning and operations, and are really popular to uh, it, as as a way of analyzing the the markets. Um, they're really uh, they kind of rely on an assumption that that markets are well behaved. Yes, uh, rational. Rational, uh, complete, uh, no information asymmetries, etc. Okay. And, and uh, no market power is another one. So, uh, so what we're trying to do with this model is, uh, is it, in particularly in, in particular look at market incompleteness. So, if you can't trade risk long term, uh, then there's then you can't necessarily use an optimization model uh, to allow market participants to just trade amongst themselves and and solve for the the social maximum and assume that. People will figure out how to uh, how to how to coordinate that. In an equilibrium model, what you do is you say everybody's solving their own individual optimization, and uh, there's uh, ways in which the solutions to those optimization problems need to coordinate. So they all need to agree on a price and uh, quantities and stuff like that. But they're all solving their own individual private interest. As opposed to an optimization model, where you're, where oh. you're just solving the global optimum, uh, the social optimum, uh, you're, you're you're solving everybody's individual uh, individual private interest. Okay, so this is a distinction I did not understand. I just used it as a oh, this is a term I'm familiar with, optimization model, but it's not. <laughs> so great clarification. And the distinction here is, it, optimization models assume market efficiencies and completeness and that whereas in equilibrium right, right. it's just i'm just doing my private i'm just optimizing my own little interests and the market may not work i don't care because i'm profiting on, on in this in, inefficient market exactly, because i have right. asym, asymmetric yeah. information and a bunch of other things sure transaction costs and yeah yeah so now i gotta go read the whole article again uh through that lens so we may have to do this again um <laughs> Uh, the you know the prompt that led me to actually reaching out was actually uh, when you shared this optimization model on Twitter. Your your second tweet in the thread really resonated with me because it is it's to be honest it's an assumption I have right and and this is I'm gonna quote you I'm gonna quote you I'm gonna quote a tweet is have you ever had that before have you ever been quote a, a quote tweeted like not just on Twitter but like, like oh I think in, maybe in like I'm... news articles by News Data um, not yet. I, I'm not sure. I think there may have been a time, but I, okay. I can't remember now. So 
Okay, well, well it's see. happening now. It's happening now. Uh, <laughs> happening. Hardly a week goes by without someone on hashtag energy Twitter speculating that proliferation of zero marginal cost variable resources, reading wind and solar, will mean the end of power markets as we know them. After all, how can you base everything on marginal costs when they are zero, unquote? Okay, that is my mental model. That is the mental model I have been walking into life with to say, hey, if we're going to get a bunch of wind and solar uh, with zero marginal costs, not that electric markets are going to work, but they're all going to it's just going to be zero. I'm going to have a bunch of electricity. I need capacity. Um, You're coming from a different angle. I want to better understand because it sounds like academics are kind of settled that electric prices are going to be basically the same on average, with maybe more variability. Okay, help me out here. Yeah, so I think that there's there's a couple aspects here. So th- number one is that uh, if, if you have a wind and solar dominated system, uh, in, at least in, 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 the, in the math model world, you'll still get pri- non-zero prices yeah, sometimes often or, or regularly and maybe even often. So, uh, so one part of it is that uh, to have a system that's, that's really driven by wind and solar, you're, you're going to probably have a lot of demand side resources, or you're going to have some backup thermal resources or uh, something else in the system uh, that's, that's maintaining supply demand balance. I see you've got the, the supply demand balance on your vest there. Uh, and, and so you're gonna have something in the system that has a value that they place on electricity. If it's on the demand side, they could be using that demand or that electricity to produce a product. So there's an opportunity cost if they shut it off or it could just, uh, uh, it, it could be a thermal resource where it's really expensive if you have uh, uh, a, a big carbon tax or something like that, but it's, uh, it, it has a price attached to it. So then, the question is how frequently are those resources uh, setting the price? And it could be relatively often, especially when storage enters into the equation. Okay. Because for storage to set a price, they need to be thinking about, is there a time in the future in my decision horizon where I might be able to get a better price? Yes. And, and so they're going to offer into the market as kind of a risk-adjusted probability on the, the probability that we're going to need to use one of these more expensive thermal resources or demand side resources anytime in the near future. And so that has the effect of pulling forward a non-zero price into, into a lot of hours. So um, I think you used a term in the paper. It was, uh, and I wrote it on my whiteboard, which is off, off to the right. Uh, so it's opportunity cost-based resources. Is that the concept of these battery storage or they're bidding in on this opportunity cost instead yeah, of? Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. And the, and the demand side too is, you know, the, they have some purpose that they're using the electricity okay. for. So if they forego the use of electricity, they, they, they incur an opportunity cost. And uh, so I had a couple so go ahead. I, no, I had a couple follow-ups here. Sorry to interrupt you. It, one is, it, it sounds like in the in in your article, you did talk to. It seems like research that on average the prices will be very similar to today's prices. Like it's not because that kind of stuck out to me that the the range of outcomes there may be you know, more scarcity events. We'll get into that a little bit more, but um, but on average the prices will be fairly close. It's it, it, and in some ways it wasn't. Um, it, well, I don't know how to articulate, it, but I thought I read that into your article that in what experiment experientially yeah. and analytically, it seems like prices will actually be near where they are today. Yeah. So this is a, this is one of the things, one of those things where it's kind of who knows. Yeah. So if you, if you model this out, uh, a lot depends first off on the, the, the technology costs. So as they change, that'll, that'll change what the average cost of the system is. And then a lot is also dependent on what policy instruments are used okay. to influence the way the markets go. Yep. If you put in a carbon tax, that will raise wholesale electricity prices because all the gas and coal plants in the system will be bidding at higher yep. at higher levels. Um, if you, instead of doing a carbon tax, you do a production tax credit, that will reduce prices in the system because all the winds now bidding at negative $23 a megawatt hour or whatever it is. Yep. So uh, uh, 
so the, the policy okay. instruments are going to make a big difference. Uh, and then in addition to the, the way the technology costs go over the next 30 years uh, are going to make a big difference. And uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, at least based on any, anything that I've done, I don't have a good way of guessing, is it higher on average? Is it lower on average? Uh, can't tell you. Uh, where I'm somewhat more confident is that it will be more volatile. So okay. higher, higher vari variability in the prices. Okay, and that's that, the other that side. That stems from the, the wind and the solar being variable. So that, that comes to this other question I had on this topic, which was around that if you're if the cost opportunity cost based resources like demand response and batteries um, are going to be part part of what sets this price, aren't you going to need a lot of depth in that market in order to have, you know, to minimize scarcity? Don't you need depth on both sides to make sure that it's a stable market? I, I think a lot of this is like, where's my market depth in demand response and where's my market depth in batteries. Um, otherwise, I'm just always going to be at the price cap if there isn't enough uh, to, to actually set marginal prices. But help me out here. I don't, I don't know yeah. if I'm thinking this right. So, uh, so I think that you do need, so the, the amount that you need is going to depend on the mix of resources in the system. So uh, it, you could have, uh, you know, at, at Present in a lot of markets, we have five or ten percent of the demand in the system of the peak demand in the system is registered as demand response. Okay, it does not seem very deep. It's not very deep, and and we do have you know times when we need to have load shedding of supposedly firm load because we just don't have a way of of specifying you know this demand can be can be curtailed uh, because they've signed up in a DR program or. or or they're price responsive in some way, whereas this other load is is genuinely firm. Um, so I, I think that you you probably the more wind and solar in the system, the more valuable it is to have responsive demand, and the more uh, you're able to avoid firm load shedding uh, if if you have more responsive demand. Um, a precise number on what percentage needs to be needs to be responsive, I. I I don't really have a good uh, good estimate there, but I, I I think there is modeling modeling that tries to look at that. Do you have any like directional ideas on how like as you think about this? Uh, I'm looking at my whiteboard again. Opportunity cost based resources. How how uh, a battery like a four hour battery works uh, versus load? Is there on the demand side uh, some sensitivity there to the differences between a load that you can shut off for? I don't know, longer than four hours or a four hour battery that has to get recharged. Um, is there any insights there on the, well, I'll call it fungibility of those demand side uh, resources. And if there is some technological threshold of battery needs in order to actually make this functional? Well, there's uh, there's certainly um, some, there's some, there's some uh, complementarity in the sense that they're, they're both providing flexibility to the system yeah. in a sense. And so uh, the more DR you have, the less storage you would need in order to uh, maintain balance and smooth things out. Uh, the less DR you have, the more, uh, the more storage uh, would be valuable. Um, uh, storage, I think, is, is probably on balance more flexible in the sense that there's no uh, external user that, that that you need to be considering the needs of. There's with load. There's often complicated configurations with the industrial equipment. You can't just cut off power and, uh, and, and, and expect to be able to turn on your production line again three hours later. And, yep. Uh, got a bunch of people stuff. standing around being like, "What do you want me to do for three right. hours? You got to pay me. That's right. for sure." Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, and and you can damage the equipment, and you yeah. can if you're if you're trying to operate an aluminum smelter, you don't want it to cool down and uh, and, and everything to solidify. So there's lots of complicated kind right. of uh, process related things in in uh, in responsive demand where uh, trying to model out exactly how responsive they are and on what time scales and how much advance notice they need and how many times they can do it in a given month or a given summer. Um, that's all very complicated. Whereas batteries are a little bit simpler because that's what they're there for is charging and discharging uh, on the on the electrical system. So. Uh, so it's a little bit easier uh, to comprehend in that sense. 
I, I really want to keep going on this because we live. I live in the Pacific Northwest, which has a bunch of hydro, so that's a storage resource. And I'm wondering if like demand response is less uh, important for a de- electrified or deeply electrified market. I'm not saying that right, but whatever. Uh, you get it. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, then it would be in some other region without as much hydro storage. But we're we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, right? That's. Uh, they had plenty of time for that some other day. Um, I wanted to pivot to, I think, one of the conclusions in this uh, work on the deep de- electric markets and deep decarbonization. I'm going to pull it up. So if you're on, uh, those of you on, uh, let me get it, ah, on YouTube, it's going to be up. So in this working paper, uh, you identify one of the challenges of the design of resource adequacy mechanisms is making sure that financial obligations are compatible with the diverse risk profiles of resources in the market. Okay. That's a statement I'm going to make as my interpretation. Is that at least closely right? Uh, yeah. So I think that the, um, maybe I would, I would back up to give a little bit more context here. Yes. So um, there's, uh, there's a, there's a sense in which, okay. So we have the, we have uh Uh, capacity markets in most of the U.S. We have resource adequacy mechanisms in in a lot of the a lot of the other areas, and this is outside of ERCOT, which doesn't have any sort of resource adequacy. Um, and the 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 challenge with all of them, I think, is that uh, if you think about what a capacity payment is, what you're really paying for is energy during scarcity. So. Uh, I've never thought of it that way before. So thank you for enlightening me, Professor. Yeah. So so and if 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 you if you come at this from a mathematical uh, modeling standpoint, yep. this this is kind of uh, becomes kind of clearer because when you model the system, you don't need to put in any specific resource adequacy mechanism or requirement. You just say I need to meet my uh, my power demand. You just got to meet your load. I got to maintain balance. Got to maintain the uh, balance. If I don't, I'm going to penalize it by the value of lost load. And then uh, what you end up with is you end up with the price for energy in every node and every five minute period or hour period or however you're modeling the system. And you just get payments for energy. And so what we have in uh, in, in most markets, is that uh, the the prices are not allowed to go up to the level that they wouldn't they need to in the math models. Right. We want so, to cap on this somehow. We don't want unbounded risk. They, right. So so people don't like uh, exercise of market power, and one way of of limiting that is is you put a cap. Uh, people don't necessarily like unbounded risk, although they don't always put it that way, and then. Uh, they they want to cap prices for that reason, so we put caps on on the uh, on the spot price that is uh, that is showing up in the market, and then we invent this other product called capacity or called resource adequacy or some other name for it. And what we're trying to do is take all those payments that the math models say should have happened for the higher prices of of electricity and convert it into a another commodity. Uh, so we're going to define some other commodity called capacity or called resource adequacy or called something else and make payments for this other uh, other Service. commodity. It's Service. a commodity? Well, they try to make it a commodity, but, it, you know, it's it's not truly a commodity. It, and, and so that's that's uh, part one of the challenges here. That's part one of the – okay. Yeah, so um, – so, uh, so this is all – by way of getting circling back to uh, the the prompt here, which is to say, when you do that, when you strip out the volatility in the spot prices and create another product and sell it alongside the energy, what you're effectively doing is a risk trade. Okay. So you're 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 telling people you're going to give me this upfront payment, and I'm going to give you this energy during scarcity. So okay, uh, but I'm also going to give you energy all the time because I'm I'm like because this is resource addition, right? 
So I, I, I'll give you that anyway, but I, you'll still have to pay the normal price for that. Uh, it, so you'll still have to pay the normal price for, for the energy all the time, but I'm gonna give you a discount basically on, on, the, on the energy that I'm selling you during scarcity conditions. So it kind of works like an option contract in finance where uh, if the price goes above $1,000, a megawatt hour or whatever the, the, the cap is in your market, then you only have to pay a thousand for the energy. Uh, but so instead of prices going to 9,000, like they do in Texas, they only, they stop at a thousand, but I've paid you in advance uh, for this, for this option. Uh, so I've given you this capacity payment. And, uh, and so it ends up working out for the, the generator. They can still get paid, uh, but, uh, but it, it affects the timing of the of the payments that are made. So the the mechanism for this to actually work though is resource addition, right? That's what we're trying to do with this uh, hedging mechanism: is incentivize uh, new entries uh, to come online because in this the the scarcity pricing is driven by less supply that is necessary to meet demand, right? That's what's driving our scarcity. So are we trying to incentivize? new entries to provide additional supply. And if you do that, this is one of the things I just do. I'm not an economist, uh, but aren't you going to bring down the whole curve? Like if you're adding new things to your resource stack, you, aren't you going to bring down the whole curve throughout the whole year? I, I don't know why I'm on this yeah, tangent. Yeah. Right. So, so, um, uh, so you, if you, if you make a, you make capacity payments to the to new plants that are going to come online, you make them to existing plants to make sure they stay in business and don't retire. Uh, and then, and then uh, in theory, at least, you'll get kind of an, an efficient level of resources in the system to, to get you the, the reliability outcomes that, that, okay. uh, that, that you're trying to get. Okay. I'm going to come back to the paper, which I think was some of the insight here is in some of these markets, that link is broken, right? You have these scarcity events and you have a cap, but you aren't, you don't have this, what you called an option product to actually shift that value. So you don't incentivize the new resources. Am I, am I thinking of that? Right? So, so yeah, what's, what I think goes on in most of the markets is uh, so if, if you look at this in a purely financial market context, what you ought to have is you, you have the spot prices and then you have an option or, a, or other financial instrument that's trading against those spot prices and everything is kind of coherent because uh, you have a way of assessing was the trade valuable or not, uh, which resources performed and, and actually uh, produced energy when the spot prices were high. Um, and, 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 and any, so you have a way of, of figuring out how every, all the resources should be accredited, uh, what penalties should be uh, assessed for non-performance, uh, things like that, all get sorted out in a, in, a, in a clean mathematical way where if you have full strength spot prices. Rational and coherent. Rational and coherent. Yeah. Optim you could use an optimization model for this. Exactly. Yeah. It's all, it's all, it all, it's all clean. It's, it's all, all clean. Simple. Okay. Uh, well, I shouldn't call it simple, but you know, it's, it's at least it works out. So, uh, so if, if you have a situation where you never produce the spot prices, then all of a sudden you get into all sorts of uh, tricky questions about uh, how do we accredit each individual resource on the basis of the energy it's going to produce right. in scarcity events statistically. And then if it doesn't produce, how do we penalize it? Or do we just choose not to penalize it because you know it, it, maybe it wasn't their fault and maybe we're willing to uh, societally absorb that risk. Uh, but where do you strike that balance of, uh, we want to incentivize good performance from the resources uh, and we want to accredit things appropriately, um, but we don't have the kind of underlying spot prices that would, would do this in a clean way. So we have to do lots of analysis and lots of bargaining and stuff like that to, to figure out how we're going to design that resource adequacy mechanism. And are what, is what you're saying here that each of those resources needs a different type of risk management product? Right. The different resources need different risk management products because like a natural gas plant has a different risk. It's fuel risk that you're managing and need to make sure is accounted for in these uh, risk 
uh, risk, what do you call them? They're like mechanisms. Yeah, risk trading mechanisms. Risk trading mechanisms. So, yeah, so if you look at if you look at any market uh, in, in the US or, or abroad, there's gonna be a big mix of trading instruments of PPAs with different tenors and different shapes and things like that. There's uh, you know baseload futures and there's options of various strike prices and there's you know various bespoke instruments that that uh, that investors in individual plants or developers of, of individual plants can try to figure out how they're gonna manage their risk efficiently. Uh, but what we do with the resource adequacy mechanism is kind of like I, I was saying earlier, we say we're going to have an option with a strike price of $1,000 or the price cap. And, uh, and all of the generators in the system are going to use that instrument, that financial instrument, part of their risk management uh, portfolio. And if you think about uh, if you think about it in that financial, in the, in the in the in terms of the financial consequences or the risk management consequences, there's no particular reason why some resources would want option with that strike price, uh, and and they might prefer some other type of, of contractual form uh, altogether. And so, when we design a resource adequacy mechanism, I think one of the important considerations is uh, by uh, kind of implicitly affecting the, the financial risk in different assets, are we affecting the types of investments that get made and, uh, and therefore the, the types of resources we get in the system and, uh, and, the, and the reliability of the results? Keep going. Keep going here. Because this is part of the, I mean, this is kind of the summation of your paper, right? Around, hey, in a, in a deeply decarbonized market, you're going to have uh, less volatility. Can you talk a little bit about how this translates to what it means for a deeply uh, decarbonized and with high variable resource penetration? Yeah, so I, I think that the, uh, uh, the, the, the question in, in, in my mind becomes, okay, if we're, if we're gonna have a resource adequacy mechanism, uh, we want to design it in such a way that, that it's gonna help market participants manage their risk. We don't wanna overspecify the contractual form because then we run the risk of uh, steering things in an in a inefficient direction or a okay. wrong direction. And, uh, and in particular, just to make this more concrete, uh, the, the paper that, that we wrote a couple of years back um, uh, called Asymmetric Risk and, and Fuel Neutrality in Electricity Capacity Markets uh, basically argued that, uh, that the capacity markets as they exist today are implicitly biased in favor of high marginal cost resources. That makes and, sense to me. Uh, and, and since all of our, it, it so happens that all of our scalable low carbon technologies are low marginal cost. So so what that, that means is that at least potentially existing capacity markets are kind of putting the brakes on efforts to, to decarbonize and skewing the capacity mix back towards the, the high marginal cost resources, which is, um, I think, not something that we want to be doing in, in order to, to meet public policy goals. And, uh, and it also can have consequences for reliability, as, as, uh, as was made very clear in the uh, Texas event, it's not as if natural gas plants are uh, are faultless in terms of uh, their ability to to, to fail uh, in a correlated way, and so we don't want to be uh, skewing the mix uh, necessarily in that direction from a reliability standpoint or a, or a decarbonization standpoint. Um, and and of course we don't want to be doing that in a from a cost standpoint uh, either. When we wrote this paper, natural gas cost three bucks a, a mega, uh, an MMBTU. Now it costs eight bucks an MMBTU. Uh, it's it's not great from a, a financial risk management standpoint to to be uh, so dependent on on natural gas in the in the wholesale electricity markets. And that was kind of one of the conclusions out of your more recent paper, which was you know because you're removing the fuel price. Uh, variability in these high re renewable uh, variable renewable resource portfolios you get uh you get less volatility in returns for the resources yeah for the for the wind and solar resources in particular because you you 
kind of stripped the fuel price volatility out of the system, they, they had lower risk overall. Uh, and since they were receiving the bulk of the investment, what that meant is that overall, the system had, uh, had less investment risk. Um, on, the, on the flip side, the peaking resources and the back, backup resources saw um, increased risk, and, and that was because the, the kind of the scarcity events or the, uh, the extremes became concentrated in, in, a, in a smaller number of years. And so uh, they were kind of more dependent on those rare events uh, to, to get their revenues. So if you think about financing the, the, the remaining peaking system, uh, peaking or backup equipment that we need in the system or D, DR resources or things like that, uh, that becomes a little bit more challenging because of the, the, the reliance on scarcity events on, on their end. And one of the things before we pivot to the next prompt and the next kind of item of discussion, I want to say, I had never had a mental model that kind of translated the skewness of your revenues for a resource into something like your investment risk. But I got that out of your paper. I find that incredibly valuable. What really helpful in my mental model to think of your revenue distribution and how skewed it is to your risk. That, that's probably, I don't know if that, where that, that was just the first time I'd heard it. It was incredibly helpful in my mental model. So thank you. Well, I'm glad, to, glad. And I, I think that there's, you know, this is one area where you need a lot of assumptions on, on how you translate the revenue distribution into a cost of capital. And I certainly don't think that, that we have the final and best answer on, on making that translation. Uh, but uh, circling back to, to the very first thing you said, uh, the, one of the nice things about Energy Twitter is that there's actual project developers and financiers and things like uh, people like that on Twitter who, who will say, you know, kind of here's how I think about risk. Um, it might not work in a formal model because people are using heuristics and judgment and, right. and their experience. Uh, but having that um, people weigh in on here's how they think about translating revenue volatility into, into a concrete investment uh, really does help kind of uh, think about how to model that. Well, that heuristic, it's, it's one of the things like this help might kind of that images, images really help. And that kind of image of a distribution that's a very skewed uh, helps my mental model. So uh, we're both we're both helping each other out. Uh, I'm just uh, the peanut gallery on energy Twitter. I love listening to all smarter people talk about stuff. But uh, with that, I'm going to pivot back to uh, the Winter Storm Uri event in Texas to talk a little bit uh, about your results uh, in the paper. So you did a, a full paper with uh, at all uh, a bunch of people who, and I will put all of the citations in the show notes with links. It'll be great. I'm going to steal your citation method. I don't know how to cite things. I just link, uh, link in Substack, you know? Uh, that works. Yep. <laughs> um, so in this investigation, it, it looks like you, you investigated these three links between spot prices and investment decisions that may be broken. And you kind of did an analysis of this, a numbered list. The first, uh, the formation of spot prices themselves. Second, the ability of investors to forecast the distribution of those spot prices, including properly analyze and incorporating tail events. And the third, the translation of the distribution of pricing into forward-looking investments. So it sounds to me from the paper that your conclusion, it's the third, translating projected prices into investments. Um, is that, is that, did I interpret your paper right in that aspect? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, I, I, I kind of hinted uh, at with um, the, the, the summary up, up uh, before you said, maybe it's not surprising, but there were a lot of hot takes on, on Twitter and elsewhere Great for uh, takes. that focus on the first two, first two explanations. So yeah. one, one, that, one that jumped out at me was um, uh, Tom Fanning, who's the CEO of Southern. And he said, after the event, he said something along the lines of, if the markets don't value resilience, you won't get resilience. And it's a little bit of a, a, a strange comment in the sense that ERCOT posted prices of $9,000 a megawatt hour for five days in a row. So if you were in a position to deliver energy, it was, you were rewarded. It was, it was very rewarding to, to have that resilience. So at least in a literal sense, the markets very much paid for resilience. Um, so a lot of the immediate uh, adjustments in the market have been, yeah, let's you know just push up the spot prices a little bit. And that to us is kind of beside the point. 
uh, the, the, the markets demonstrated a willingness to, to pay for anybody who was able to, to deliver energy during that event. And, and, uh, and fixing that is not, is not uh, really the, the core issue. So um, one of the, like, so I was reading context from the, the other paper uh, that you wrote with Jesse Jenkins into this one. And one of the, the crosswalks I did in my head was you had this quote in the, the earlier paper that said, the phenomenon of insufficient demand side interest in hedging, which is especially acute in electricity because re re retailers have downside protection in the form of rolling blackouts which reduce their obligation and scarcity events. And for me, that was the crosswalk, right? This translation of this forward-looking investment, if I have protection, downside protection as a retailer to just shut it off, uh, is that part of what's broken? Or, there, or did I read too much yeah. context into, from yeah. the first paper into the second one? Right. No, no, that's that's absolutely right. And and I, I we, we do talk about it in the, in the Texas paper as well. There's, especially in these kind of acute uh, situations, there's reasons why you think you know, normal contracting doesn't work. So if, if a retailer can go bankrupt and default on its obligations, then that translates into a resource adequacy problem because somebody contracting with that, uh, that retailer uh, can no longer count on being paid okay. in an extreme event, and they have to discount the, the expected revenue that they'll get, and that will affect the, the decision that they'll make. Okay. Uh, if uh, how we phrased it in, in, in the quote you just read is a retailer might uh, might say, OK, well, here's what I think the, the demand I need to cover is going to be. So this is what I need to procure. But if there is a rolling blackout, uh, I'm just as likely to be cut as as the as somebody who didn't procure. Yeah, and there's an externality there. And so I don't have the incentive to, to procure my full amount. Um, there's, there's other failures on the supply side where if, I, if I'm a gas supplier and my equipment freezes up, uh, I can declare force majeure and I don't have to deliver on my contractual obligations and, and, and the kind of this, uh, this uh, uh, idealized complete market type of vision just, it just kind of breaks down in that type of situation. So, uh, so these, these extreme events like URI are really uh, the, the most extreme example of transaction costs, illiquidity, uh, breakdowns in contracting, uh, issues in translating, uh, in, in translating those spot prices into something that somebody can, can uh, make, a, make an investment based on. And so this is really the distinction between a market that needs to be equilibrium, have an equilibrium model versus an optimization model. Because these all seem like externalities that make it inefficient, like incomplete market risk. Is that what you called it in the paper? Yeah, incomplete markets. Yeah, incomplete markets because you are or or, or, or I just call it incomplete markets in risk. Okay. Yeah. Good. And so that's that's what we have here, right? It's it's if you if there are these other mechanisms, out of market mechanisms to resolve this risk, um, you aren't providing the right incentive to shift that energy from this peak event and spread it out with a new resource. But so that what I'm interpreting? Yeah, yeah. A lot of this is just me trying to interpret stuff, Professor. That's perfect. Regurgitate and try to make it make sense to me. Thank you for yeah. helping me make it make sense. So all this is part of, you know, uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, is trying to go from a bilateral market and we're incrementaling our way into uh, more robust uh, markets. And the Western Power Pool is developing a resource adequacy program and CAISO and SPP are developing proposals for real-time day-ahead markets uh, that the Northwest is considering. So in light of like your analysis and your insights into electric markets, what advice do you have for those of us in the Pacific Northwest as we're thinking about market evolution and market design uh, about ways to not fall into the same hole that other like ERCOT did or others have? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think that uh, the, the, the way I'm coming around to, to think about it is uh, so as, as the, 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 Kind of first question you want to ask is, do we need a resource adequacy program at all, or should we just rely on market participants to, to figure any, everything out? And I think what we're saying in the in the Texas paper is, no, that's not going to work. We do act, we do in fact need a, a resource adequacy program. And uh, and so then in the Texas paper, we kind of talk about the three 
uh, major questions that, that need to be resolved in, in establishing such a resource adequacy mechanism. The first is, can you manage to get the spot prices up to the full strength? So in Texas, they, they set the, the cap at 9,000 until they, they put it down recently. But uh, the idea was, if you allowed the cap to go high enough and you have an administrative demand curve for operating reserves that, that, that uh, boosts up prices, you can get all of the rev revenue you need to pay for resources, in theory, in represented in the spot prices. Okay. And, uh, and as I was, I was talking a little bit about this before, but the... Uh, if you get those full strength spot prices, that provides the best or sort of the cleanest way of evaluating which resources actually produce during scarcity and uh, and deserve being accredited, uh, at least ex post, as 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 a capacity resource or as a as a supplier of, of energy during scarcity. So. The Eastern markets in the US have, have been trying to boost the, the energy prices, uh, the energy spot, energy market prices uh, as a way of, of, of getting stronger performance incentives in the real time market and kind of uh, softening the need to do the accreditation and do figure out good penalties and do these all, all these other kind of more contentious issues uh, that that capacity markets get uh, that get debated in the context of capacity markets. If you can shift those into full strength energy market prices, that's a kind of a cleaner way of doing things. Okay. So, uh, so let's assume we can't get there, Eddie. Like, I know that we right, have the same right. we have the same fundamentals as everybody else, right? We're electric utilities. Yeah. Uh, and nobody wants to shut off load, but it's, I don't know. It, it could just, it's, it's inefficient. These, we need an equilibrium model. What's, what's so yeah, using yeah. an equilibrium so model. So, so that's kind of the question. Number one is, can you do that? Or are the, uh, you know, the, the political realities and the, the, the trade-offs such that that's just not going to happen. Um, actually I'll follow up on one thing there. Is it more likely you could be able to do that because you have so much storage resources and, opportunity cost-based resources in the Northwest that aren't uh, as prevalent in other areas. So it is the p presence of large hydro dams uh, more likely to where you can do that? Yeah. Or is it actually yeah. make it le I mean, less likely? I'm doing this live. Yeah, yeah. It seems maybe it make it less likely because there may be less so scarcity I, events I, for new resources. I think, uh, no, I, I think the, the, uh, the, less of a risk of a scarcity event or the uh, the lower the volatility in the underlying price, the more willingness there there would be to go that route. Um, Norway doesn't need a capacity market. Or the, or they've decided they don't need a capacity market. And part of it is they have huge reservoirs that stabilize prices over over long periods of time. and uh, and if you have kind of an underlying price distribution that's not very volatile, Saying that we're going to have full strength volatile in the in this uh, volatility in the spot prices is is uh, completely palatable, whereas if you're in uh, in uh, in a system like Texas, uh, they've they've made the the decision to accept full strength price volatility, but that is a bigger lift uh, because it's just a more volatile place. It's a, it's a more volatile market to be in uh, because of the resource mix. Okay. Okay, but we, we were keeping going. So assuming we don't get to just full strength prices, we're going to have a cap. Who knows what it'll be, but there'll probably be a cap. And we're going to try to come up with mechanisms to shift that revenue that would come in above the cap over the entire curve. That's what, that's what I understand. This is my mental model you've now given me. What, mm -hmm. what, what, how should we think about that uh, as we're developing and these markets are coming into, you know? Yeah, so, so uh, let, me, uh, let me go to question number two. Which we we talk about in the in the in the Texas paper. Question number two is, what's the contractual form that's implicit in your resource adequacy mechanism? Okay. So this gets to the, the the issue from before. If you have a fully decentralized market, you would expect everybody to kind of create their own contracts and the ways that manages their own risk in the best way, and you'd have this complex assortment uh, of all the market participants figuring that out. If you have a centralized resource adequacy model, 
that doesn't work, you need to define one instrument or a small number of instruments uh, that you're going to auction off in a centralized way and try to land on something that's going to work for the, the market, broadly speaking, uh, and try to do that in a way that's not going to skew, uh, skew the system toward resources that are well adapted to that risk hedging uh, instrument. Okay. So, uh, so just a little bit more concretely, uh, we need to uh, not do capacity markets as they're currently structured and, and think about a more holistic uh, uh, risk management instrument. Um, Any idea I'm, what that would look like? I don't really. I, uh... Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm scooping you here because uh, one of the candidates here, and, and we mentioned this in the, in the paper, is, is Frank Wolock's proposal in PISO for the... I read that paper. Yeah, so, and uh, spoiler alert for the, uh, the the listeners, but we uh, he sent, Paul sent that paper in advance, so I knew he was going to bring it up, and I scooped him, uh, but one of the candidates there is to say, we can have a, a, a standard standardized contract uh, that covers uh, electricity demand uh, in a way that's defined differently. It's not like a, a capacity construct it's uh, it's a it's a different contractual form uh, that's closer to a total requirements type of uh, type of contract uh, and uh, and that might get you better results in terms of your long-term resource adequacy that's it's uh, we're gonna get into it uh, but before we do like so one of the things that this kind of incrementaling approach has me wondering is um, th- during this mid transition, we're it seems like if you're like if you're going from we're a bilateral market, which everybody has their own rules of procurement for resource for resources to make sure their own risk portfolio is managed, right? Uh, and if you're incrementally your way, we're currently uh, Bonneville's operating under the energy imbalance market, which is kind of a new market with its own little resource sufficiency tests and stuff like that. But as you go to more real time, robust real time markets, um, and as you go to day ahead markets, I'm wondering if the Northwest um, is kind of falling into the Texas trap where if you don't have standard resource adequacy de- definition across the portfolio and you still have a market with some price caps or inefficiencies, the same inefficiencies that everywhere else does, are you falling into a similar trap um, where you have this incomplete market in risk? Am I saying that right? Incomplete markets in risk. Yeah, uh, so it might be a, um, so there's there's uh, multiple things that can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, every day, every day. And, I got, you got and, two kids, I got three kids. Anything, anything yeah. can go wrong. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, and I think that, so part of it is, is the, uh, is the, the missing markets and risk. Part of it is the, uh, the, the failure to have the full strength spot prices and um, and if you don't have the full strength spot prices, it, it becomes really difficult to, to negotiate. You know, uh, did did a given region supply what they needed to over the course of the year in this in the scarcity hours? Uh, and how do we penalize people? How do we uh, how do we incentivize people correctly? And um, Certainly in, in Kaiso, when they had the, the outages a couple summer, summers ago, one of the things they said was, well, we were probably crediting solar too much because uh, after sundown, the, the solar production goes down. And uh, if you credit solar in your resource adequacy program too high uh, relative to, to its production in, in an event like that, um, that can get you in, into a reliability problem. So there's a there's a there's a problem whenever you have kind of an, an administrative judgment on what the resource adequacy contribution of, of different resources is going to be. Um, there's a there's the chance that you have a, a reliability problem, and then the risk of a uh, of a shortfall is borne by the customers who don't have power, as opposed to the supplier who is unable to produce the power that they have a resource adequacy commitment to, to produce. And uh, um, 
so I think that's kind of the, the larger challenge in, in the CAISO setting and, and in, in the West without full strength prices. Uh, how do you accredit resources in a, in a way that's, uh, that's fair and will also uh, track the developments as the system changes, as the technology mix uh, in the system changes? Uh, how do you uh, uh, determine res resource adequacy valuations that will actually continue to work as the system changes, and that's a tricky, a tricky problem. And so, uh, so I'm interviewing uh, Kaiso's CEO Elliot Mainzer next week we're in live. We're going to do it live. This is a promo. If you got to the end of the episode, you get a pre like a promo for the next uh, uh, interview with with Elliot. It's going to be great. But it seems like it, like as you're talking through the two things, right? So there is there like we're talking about day ahead and real time price for like markets and participating in these markets. But each of the participants, like not all of the participants will have the same uh, like capacity accreditation, right? Because those resource adequacy programs aren't part of the day ahead market. We're going to do like resource sufficiency tests, it sounds like, for like, do you, are you coming into the hour balanced? But the accreditation of those resources for our long term outs is not going to be set, like they aren't going to be talking. They aren't going to be evaluating mm -hmm. those on the same framework. Now, is mm -hmm. that – actually, I, as I was listening to you, this is maybe more of a decentralized uh, uh, acquisition, resource adequacy acquisition, and maybe it's not inherently worse. It's different, and maybe – like how? it seems like there's something here I should be asking Elliot about in his mental model of how this could work in this context. What do you, is there an angle here? Is there something better I should be asking Elliot? Yeah, well, I think that the um, uh, so something I like to ask everybody and in, in, uh, uh, Kaiso in, included is is certainly the Eastern markets have have moved in the direction of trying to increase the strength in the spot prices okay. because it's it kind of eases up the, the challenges with accreditation and with uh, penalties. Okay, and, I'm a I'm a twist at one thing right here because as you you talked about this a lot, which is increasing spot prices. So is that things like uh, reducing your out of market compensation for generators to be online? That's like uh, reducing these mechanisms for out of market reimbursements for making sure somebody's online. Uh, yeah, so that's, in, that's in the near term. Market. So, yeah. So instead of, you know, uh, having a reliability unit commitment process to, to get extra things online, which will suppress real time prices, you Put it in an operating reserves demand curve, for example, okay. and then it will boost prices and get prices high enough that it makes sense for that unit to be online. So there's a kind of a coherence in uh, uh, between the the operator, the operator's instruction for that that unit to come online, okay. and the price that that is that is in the system. Okay. And in the long run, I think that's a better uh, market mechanism than. Than just a, a reliability unit commitment process or a kind of a out of market action. So what I'm hearing is really if if you have this decentralized capacity acquisition frameworks where the Western Power Plus a resource adequacy program, but, uh, Kaiso has the CPUC defining what resources it needs to acquire, like making sure that those what, what do you it's uh, the RUC, re reliability unit commitments those types of out of market acquisitions are in the prices helps make it more rational in this decentralized framework so that the participants can better experience their risk and get their compensated for their participation yeah yeah so if if you if you're if you have extra power in one of these scarcity events how much are you going to get compensated for sending it to your neighbor uh, if they're short, how much are they going to have to pay to 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 uh, make up their shortfall? Uh, and uh, and and how do you how do you determine those uh, the the prices that, that those exchanges are going to be made at? If you have a suppressed spot price, it's going to be not worth as much to uh, to to hold enough capacity on on your system, um, and uh, and so then. That's that, that kind of uh, creates these other challenges. And that's even if you have a price cap, even if you have a price cap, that, that increasing overall and making sure the, the real-time market values all of these units all the time, even if there is a cap at some point, 
will also help in this decentralized resource ac acquisition framework. Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 in general, you want to have uh, prices that are high enough, but not too high, right? right? You want them to be high enough that you can guarantee reliability in the long run, but not too high so that you're just charging customers an exorbitant amount. So, um, uh, so I think that uh, that that's obviously a challenge, but um, in general, Kaiso I think probably needs to get higher. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is helping me a bunch. Uh, I don't know if any of the listeners will find it helpful at all, but uh, I think it's helped my mental model about kind of why it matters and in which ways it matters. Um, but, but before we go, there was a, a couple other papers, and we mentioned one earlier, Frank Wolak's working paper uh, titled Long-Term Resource Adequacy in Wholesale Electric Markets. I think I have it up here I can share. Uh, or, or Long-Term Resource Adequacy in Wholesale Electric Markets with Significant Intermittent Renewables. And then Emily Grubert and Sarah Hastings-Simons co-authored a paper in, I'll call it Wiley. Uh, I don't actually know. I don't know how to – these journals, I'm not familiar. Yeah, this is not the part – They're the publisher. They're the publisher. Yeah. What was the journal? Is there – I don't know. Anyway, we're, we're going for it. Uh, they titled it Designing the Mid-Transition mid Review of Medium-Term Challenges for Coordinated Decarbonization in the United States. Any insights from those you wanted to dig a little bit deeper into or, or continuing education for electric market enthusiasts like me? Well, yeah. So I, I mentioned the Wolock paper before and – the, I think the, the core idea there is in, in the context of we, we've been talking about uh, there's a hedging aspect to any resource adequacy mechanism. And so we ought to think about how to design that in a way that's going to promote, promote resource adequacy. Uh, also, and he talks about promoting market power mitigation as, as part of the contract. contract. Um, but we can think about different contractual forms as as influencing the way uh, the, the market outcomes go. Yeah, that was a yeah interesting insights. And and so so his proposal is is uh, uh, I think a, something that that really warrants more study and, and, and consideration. Okay, you know what you know what my hot take out of this. Let's go. This for is it. basically the Bonneville uh, uh, Bonneville contract. It's a full requirements contract. They're the generator. They meet have to meet your full load requirements. Uh, so when I read through it, I was like, oh, you know what this sounds a lot like? It's this Bonneville's full requirements contract. Got to meet yeah, peaks. Got to have a they have a diverse portfolio of resources. They have to optimize them in markets. That's what I'm looking at. It seems like this is mm -hmm. basically a full requirements contract from Bonneville to serve a bunch of public power customers in the Northwest. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a kind of a, a way to get the full requirements logic into a liberalized market context, and uh, I I think there's a lot to be said for it for sure. And I'm I'm uh, also with with uh, one of my students trying to uh, trying to do a little bit of modeling on that as well to try to to try to see how that that could play out. Okay. Well, uh, when you get that paper, I would love to see it. Any other previews of academic work you're working on? Any articles, books? You gonna write a book? I'd read your book. Uh, not in the near term. You know, we uh, the, the primary mode, or certainly for junior faculty, is papers. So I'm I'm gonna pump out some more papers, and and you know, you never know. Maybe there's a book in the future. Are you any papers coming up that would be interesting to uh, electric utility enthusiasts or people who want to learn more about well, markets? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned the the one uh, that uh, so I'm, is continuing on these resource adequacy lines and, and talking about, among other things, the uh, the Wolock proposal. Um, I've been thinking a lot about transmission expansion. Uh, yes. One of the major issues in uh, liberalized markets, I would say, is that there really isn't a theoretically clean way to coordinate between centralized transmission planning and uh, liberalized generation investment. Okay. In, in kind of the old vertically integrated world or integrated resource planning world, it's a little bit easier because you're co-optimizing generation and transmission inherently. But when you have different people in charge of the, the, the different planning processes, then, uh, then you need to uh, think about how to coordinate between those. And that's, uh, uh, that has not been easy. I think that's one of the, the major issues in, in liberalized markets. So trying to think about that as well. 
So you're thinking about it. Are you are you are you thinking about it with a pen, writing some papers on it? Yeah, I mean, it's not. Uh, I don't want to promise anything imminently, but it's uh, it's going to happen eventually. Yeah, I, I I saw a tweet from you around transmission expansion, and your I think it was a hypothesis. What was it around? If we get a bunch of transmission, this isn't like the DOE's loan guarantee program or or whatever that was. It's just gonna. It's not gonna end up being rotating because you're gonna have a bunch of Marketing. Yeah, what was that? Well, there was something is, there. Yeah, this. Well, I think this is kind of a an issue that has faced transmission from the beginning of liberalization. There's, there's kind of this implicit expectation that transmission lines should should be able to cover their costs through congestion charges. Yeah. Or you should be able. You should need to find off takers for your transmission line and sign contracts with people people who are willing to. Uh, to fund the construction of the line, identify those people and 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 get them to front the cash, and that just doesn't work. That it, it's not going to get you a good system if you uh, rely on that um, that type of system. It kind of needs to be centrally planned and the cost allocated uh, for to get an efficient system, uh, because an efficient system uh, won't have enough congestion. To, for it to make sense for for people to uh, to to pay the pay pay for the line and and uh, and and be able to recoup their investment. So almost as if it's part of the markets uh, becoming optimized that you have an efficient trans transportation of the electricity to make the markets more efficient. Yeah. yeah. So you need to kind of set the stage with we have an efficient transmission network, and then let the the generation investments. Uh, react to that that transmission expansion plan. This very much comports with my one of my building blocks of my mental model is load always pays. So load's got to pay for the transmission. It's not going to come through. Well, uh, ho- hopefully they pay. Uh, like with energy, they pay uh, exactly the right amount, not too little, not too much. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for agreeing to chat with me. I I love this. This was a great conversation for me. I learned a whole bunch. I hope you enjoyed it and are willing. Always. Next time you publish a paper, we should do this again. It'll be fun. To bring us Sounds good. Going. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Into the thank you. Laughter, through thick and through thin, for public power enthusiasts. Thanks to Professor Jacob Mays for taking the time to provide a remedial course in electric markets. It was an incredible, incredibly helpful and insightful conversation. Hopefully it was also infotaining. As we mentioned during the recording, we'll have more bonus content, including an interview with Elliot Mainzer that we're recording at NWPPA's annual meeting next week. That is uh, May 20 something. Uh, to make sure you don't miss the next episode or other great bonus content. In the meantime, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. You can also get some fabulous merch on Shopify, which is why I messed it up a little bit there with Spotify. They're very similar but different. Uh, you, including on Included on Shopify are beautiful and professional demand balance constraint quarter zips uh, that I was wearing during today's recording. All you have to do is search for Public Power Underground. You don't have to be subscribed to News Data to get this podcast, but it sure makes our podcast make a lot more sense. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in.